we're at yeah, right around four o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, just want to start off introducing ourselves. Uh, my name is Marcelo. Uh, I'm a solution architect at Swalom in our user experience practice, where I do visual design, development, a little bit of everything. My name is John Gully. I'm the solution principal for our mobility practice. I have a legacy in UX. Uh, Solve Consulting is here in Dallas, and we help our customers with uh, technology challenges. And most of the stuff that you're going to see today uh, come from real-world experiences and real customers and problems we've solved. This is kind of like a 201 for pattern libraries. We're not going to sell you on why you should do them. We're going to talk about what we've learned. So John, I've got a bit of a funny story. The other day, I was trying to save you. 15% or more of my car insurance. And I really hope Geico's UX team isn't here. Um, raise your hand right there. But um, I went on here, thought it looked great. You know, I like my car insurance to look really nice. I entered my zip code to get a quote. Bam! It's presented with this. Right? Raise your hand if you've seen that happen before. Right? You get that beautiful marketing homepage, and then the second you go a page in, you know, it's, it's just not as good. Um, this is a problem we see all the time, right? These redesigns that only go skin deep. You get a marketing homepage that looks great, but people can't, you know, they, they don't have the time or the resources to go any deeper. Um, you also see sites like the old United homepage that um, they, they've cleaned it up, they've redesigned it since then. But if you take a look at this design, believe it or not, there's 13 different ways to take an action on something. That's 12 different button styles just on the homepage, right? 12 or 13 ways, that's crazy. Wow. Why is it? Why is it so hard to come and redesign a website? Marcel, this code doesn't come for free, but I'm the one who has to sit here and code all this stuff, get business approval for all the new technologies for, for everything, and I've heard this consultants are kind of expensive. So, so I hear. But the fact is, the world of design hasn't evolved to fit how we build applications today. Everything we do still comes from a world where things look like this, right? There's these gorgeous custom print designs. And even, I mean, I've never even done print design, but so many of the processes and tools that we use come from this age, where it was a Don Draper-like creative director staying up until 3 a.m. cranking out design comps to reveal to the client the next day. We haven't evolved and adapted for the web. And even when companies have tried, companies like the New York Times that did this beautiful snowfall article a few months ago, um, some of it looks like a regular article, but then you'd scroll down and you'd hit these gorgeous custom animations that were super immersive. Um, this is the same problem that we saw in Geico or United, because this is just at the other end of the spectrum, right? Because the New York Times business, um, they can't scale this. They can't do this for 100 articles a day that they have to post to sustain their business. What we like to call this is a zombie interface. Um, any developer or designer in this room, probably most of you have touched interfaces like this. From a design perspective, it's, it's the type of interface where it just doesn't scale to fit the needs as an application grows, right? I go to try to fit some content in an accordion and it just doesn't, it doesn't work in there. From a code perspective, this is that CSS house of cards that you feel like if you make one change to a CSS class, your whole site's going to come falling down. Um, technically, it's alive because it's powering the website, right? It's following the design system, it's using that code, but it's really the walking dead because you can't maintain or extend it in the future. So what we're going to talk about today and start off with is really rethinking the design process, right? What does that design process look like and what's the role of the designer in that? Um, we call it building systems, not pages. We have to stop thinking about um, beautiful design comps and instead take those a step further and extract the useful bits out of them. That doesn't mean you won't design a page, it just means you have to break them apart into the fundamental building blocks of your system and build something that's scalable. Um, this is a big deal, a lot of companies are doing it. Uh, two big ones that you might have heard of. Um, a few weeks ago, Salesforce launched their Lightning design system. Um, this is something that they built for hundreds of developers within Salesforce, and they even built it for, built it for external developers. They've gone through usability testing, accessibility testing, etc. Intuit is also approaching out with their Harmony design system that they've made public recently. Yeah, and this is not just good for the designers, right? This is great for developers. We had done this with one of our customers, and then I actually got this email from one of our developers who's here saying he's crying because he likes this so much, right? He sees so much value in it. 
coupled with our agile processes and user stories, it just makes it so much less painful for him to develop. And it's really because you're breaking it down into reusable components. Developers can reuse it means they're not designing it again and recoding it over and over. Right. Even Mark Otto, who is the creator of Bootstrap, most of you have probably heard of Bootstrap, um, he gave a talk a couple years ago where he talked about building a tiny Bootstrap. Right? Think of it, and maybe it's going to use Bootstrap, maybe it's not, but it's the idea of building this system that one application, or even if your organization has multiple applications, building a Bootstrap-like system for your applications to keep that design consistent. Um, here's what here's what that process looks like for us. Right? If we're, if we're working on a greenfield application, we might start with some design prompts for various pages. But then I talked about taking that a step further. So we take those, we extract those useful bits and actually slice up those comps into those different patterns that can be reused. Then what's great about that is that your design process starts to evolve where you can then reassemble those components into various different configurations as needed. Um, here's what that looked like on a recent client of ours. Um, this was a pretty complex application in the prison telecommunications industry and um, you know, dozens and dozens of pages. And when we did these designs, you can, I know that they're really small, but you can start to extract some reusable patterns. So for example, you can see that there's a timeline twice that shows up. They look slightly different intentionally, but it's still the same general pattern where you have some icons, you have some content to the right of it with a bar going underneath it to note that it's a timeline. Same thing with our table styles. Those table styles get reused in different contexts, maybe some search results, maybe some details, um, maybe inside of a dashboard widget, but it's still fundamentally the same pattern that's getting used. Um, same thing with our dashboard widgets, and I won't, I won't be a dead horse here. And what's great about this is that as a designer, our design tools are actually starting to support this process of taking our comps and slicing them up, right? Sketch, which is very popular, you know, it's, it's kind of becoming the, the de facto standard for a lot of UI designers. They support this concept of symbols, um, which you can basically take objects that you've built and just reuse them across various pages. Even Photoshop, that a lot of people gripe about, you know, isn't built for UI design, it's built for, for photographers and editing their pictures. Over the past couple of years, they've made huge enhancements to help you focus on pattern libraries. So if you're a Photoshop user, you can actually go to the window menu uh, and select this libraries option, and you'll get this nice little palette here that lets you extract colors, that lets you extract character styles. And then the, the real nice part, you can actually put graphics in here, which really you just drag a layer or multiple layers in there. And then when I'm designing another comp, I can drag those back out and basically reassemble my layout. So I can grab my menu, I can grab my header, and just drop them in there. Adobe even lets you go a step further where you can collaborate with multiple people um, and have multiple people contributing to this pattern library. So if, if these are purely visual designers, they can start to extract those useful bits. And then when it comes to communicating that back to the developer, right? if I'm a, if I'm a visual designer who doesn't code, um, I can even take that pattern library and generate a website so my developer can come in and um, grab, the color, grab the color palettes, the font styles, etc. Yeah, so that's really great. I'm glad to see that the tools are progressing and we're not just going to end up with Photoshop and comps anymore as developers. But it still feels like you're kind of still throwing it over the fence, right? I did this one, I went off and did this design. Here's what you've got, go implement it, developer. Right? Still, still feels like there's a big divide between what the designers are doing and what the developers are implementing. That process just feels broken to me, right? We should be working together on this. How can we, how can we get developers and designers working together? How can we fix this handoff problem? You're right, John. What we have to do is start to move to these leaner design cycles, right? Where we're more focused on discovering and designing ideas, but then going around that circle and developing and testing them. So that we're really testing reality versus just pictures of what we're, of what we're, of what we want to build. And pattern libraries, are our first step to doing that. Um, they're really the bridge. So when we look at that traditional design, or that design process that we talked about where you design, slice, and assemble, the pattern library is what lives in the middle, right? It's that documentation of your design language. Um, like I mentioned before, a lot of companies are doing this, and a lot of them are publicizing them, right? Salesforce, like we talked about, but other companies, MailChimp, Walmart, the BBC, GitHub, they've all published these public style guides where you can go and see the patterns that developers are reusing. Now what's great is, let me show you what a design process can evolve into on a more mature project where you have a design language. Um, you can actually sit down and just 
start sketching out ideas, right? This could be a developer and a designer sitting in a room on a whiteboard for, for an hour to come up with ideas. Yeah, as a developer, I can already kind of visualize what's going on and get a good understanding of what the designers are asking for in this case. Yeah. Now, I wish my sketches looked this good. This is another guy on our team. But uh, basically, you know, you can even just draw boxes and then we can actually go straight into, into this, which is a screenshot of a coded prototype, right? It's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, no real data, but the idea is if you compare side by side that sketch, we can just write like user <coughs> approval, and we already have a, a widget or a building block that we can insert in there. Same thing with photos. If you look at this center section, you know, we might have a detail panel, and we already have a pattern for presenting details or something. Right? So we we start to eliminate waste in our design process. Because if you think about it, all the wireframes, all the static comps that we're creating, all of these are simply waste because they're not in the, they're not the final product that's gonna be shipped to the, the customer. Um, you know, we skip the Asher and Balsalamic step, we skip the Photoshop step. Again, this is all in a very mature design system. Um, and it results, you know, you go straight from a sketch to an interface with real code. And what that means is that the role of the designer starts to evolve in the process. Right. You know, gone are the days that a, a designer stays up until 3 a.m. and you know, and doing Photoshop comps for the big client reveal the next day. Instead, that allows me as a designer to focus more on real UX activities, like testing, uh, conducting stakeholder sessions to gather requirements, um, uh, copywriting, right? All the things that, that really affect our interface and not just creating beautiful, dribble-worthy designs. The real UX work, yep. not just visual design, right? Exactly. So taking the first step into doing this, you have to ask yourself, where does the pattern library live in our design process? Because we've actually seen it living in kind of a, a whole bunch of different places uh, in the design and development process with our clients. We've seen the sidelines, right, where maybe you have a style guide out here where you went and hired an external agency, they, they put together some brand guidelines and the developers try to follow that. So then out on the other side, you've got designers and developers building stuff that goes into the production website. This obviously falls out of sync pretty quickly. Um, we've got the exhaust pipe where maybe this is uh, a step further where designers and developers go and build stuff that gets launched on your production website, and then somehow you have a tool that do automatically documents your code and spits it out at the end. Um, but what we're really a fan of is something like the dictator, where as you design and develop, you have your it goes into your style guide, which then your production website builds out of. And so if you break those up, we can actually look at a maturity model within your design, within your company, where maybe um, you know, we can move up in that maturity model, but the most immature organizations, and we see this a lot of times, maybe have five or 10 applications, and literally the, the phrase we hear all the time is they all look completely different, or we're constantly having to sit down with developers and nitpick to fix them, right? So that's kind of the inconsistent design system. Or maybe we have the one-time design system like we talked about where, where a branding agency came in. Um, sometimes we even see some companies go so far as trying to build those manual pattern libraries, which is something we see very, we're starting to see more and more often. Um, our baseline and what we try to get clients to is an automated pattern library process where it actually shares code with the real application, right? So that way they can stay in sync. Some organizations actually go so far as having a dedicated team that's focused on building out your pattern library and maintaining it. Not every company has to go here, but like Salesforce, for example, they actually employ designers, developers, researchers, a huge team to go and actually maintain that pattern library. Um, so really what we're gonna focus on for the rest of the talk today is how do we not build a zombie pattern library, right? Just like a zombie interface that's out of date, you know, hard to maintain, how do we keep our pattern libraries maintained both from a technology perspective and just from a design process and organization? How do we move from inconsistent or manual to that automated process, right? Not every developer or every team will need the full pinnacle of having a dedicated team. Maybe you become a smaller organization and you start with that capacity. But at least let's get to some it, let's get to something that's automated so that it doesn't get out of sync and people actually use it. So um, what are some practical tips that you guys can be here today, right? When you guys get back to work on Monday, you can get started trying to build this out, right? We wanna make this really practical. Um, step one, if you've got one or multiple applications, simply sitting down and taking an inventory of the patterns that you, that you have for those applications, right? Seeing what's out there, um, and giving them names. So 
this is actually an example of an of a, um, interface inventory that we did. Uh, this was an application that our team had was already about halfway building, um, halfway done building, and they decided they probably needed a paddle builder. So we came in and we would take screenshots of the various components. So you can see that in here we take a screenshot of the desktop version of a component, the mobile version of the component, we give it a name, and maybe even take an, a, maybe even document the different screens that we saw it on. Got everybody together in a room. And it's really important at this point to have kind of the different representatives there. You want the product there, you want the designers there, people envisioning how this is going to look. And you really want someone from your development team there, that developer voice, to tell you what's realistic, what makes sense, what's easy, what's hard. Uh, and getting all of those people together in one place early in the process so this is all about. Yeah, absolutely. So once you've taken that inventory, you want to you want to then go and document the patterns, right? I'm going to show you a really mature design system, which is Salesforce's. Um, they've gone really far, and you shouldn't look at this and feel like you have to go this far, right? They've spent years and invested a lot of money in building this out, um, but this is kind of a great a great reference. So they give each component a unique name, so it's easy for developers or designers to go and reference that. Um, they give some documentation around what that pattern is and how to use it. They give you an actual rendered example in the code of how it works, right? So if I come and hover on one of these buttons, I'm gonna get that real interaction, right? Going a step further than those static prompts. You then get a code snippet, if you guys can see down here at the bottom, um, a code snippet that a developer can just come in and copy and paste. Anybody who's used Bootstrap has seen that before. Now, Salesforce goes so far as actually giving accessibility guidelines, so for people with screen readers, what do they need to know for this? And they document different variants of that particular component. But really the basic documentation that you should focus on to build this out is just naming that component and making it a unique, memorable name, writing a description, giving an example, right, that visual example that somebody can reference back to, and then the code snippet for somebody to use. You can make this whatever your organization needs. If you've got custom needs uh, for something very specific, feel free to add it in there. But these are what we found as the common things that pretty much every organization needs. And you can just start with the basics. Yeah, exactly. Now, if you're building a greenfield design system that nobody's ever consumed before, take this and go run with it. You're probably ready to go. But if you're like most of the projects that I work on, you're probably going to have to go retrofit your design system into the, the existing applications. Right? This is where things start to get a little more complex. So we kind of give two steps now. Begin with the end in mind, and then refactor your code to perfection. So what we, what we encourage is to really define, from a code perspective, where do we want to end up? What are the patterns that we want to follow? Right? We, we notice that most people tend to neglect their CSS code, and it just kind of like bloats over time, and everything is just messy. But then, go a step further and just start to refactor component by component to get there. Right? And so as you do that, a few tips that we've discovered. Um, we really love using CSS preprocessors like SAS or less. Um, we actually break each component into its own SAS file. It just makes it really easy for you to reference. If I want to go look at my hero component or my footer component, I can just go see all the code in one nice and tidy place. Then, we highly recommend namespacing the CSS. I'm just going to throw out there, I'm a really boring front-end developer, right? I don't, I don't mess with web components, Polymer, like I was in Ken Tabor's talk earlier today. I, I haven't even touched any of that, and we just keep it purely to CSS. That doesn't mean you can't use those with your pattern library, but these tips are really boring ones, and I'm a fan of boring developers. <laughs> this looks familiar. Uh, some of these patterns come directly from the BAM style of writing yeah. CSS. Yeah, if you guys can see that, basically the approach that we do is, hey, I'm going to build a hero component, so I create the hero component, but then I put a hero underscore underscore logo, where that's the logo style within the hero. It's kind of this nice, tidy little class that I can just apply to anything in the logo. So this makes it really easy that, for example, let's say that I already have an accordion component that I just can't mess with because it will introduce a ton of bugs. Maybe I go build a new version of the accordion component, namespace it differently, and then as the new pages get built, I can reference that new version of the component and just kind of leave the old ones out there until we get a chance to go tackle them. Right? That's just the realities of development. We can't always have the, the, the big bomb redesign. We just have to go bit by bit on our application. From there, finding project is your friend. Right? If you're trying to clean up your CSS, use a lot of, uh, most, most code editors, it's just a nice little shift command F. Um, and it'll let you search across the project. You know, go find those classes, because what that's
that's going to do is let you go test when I make these CSS changes. Here's all the pages that I need to go make sure that, that, that those changes don't break anything. But at the same time, um, it can be kind of hard if you have a class. Say, let's say I have a class name of table. But if I search my application, I also have the HTML element table. Um, this regular expression search that I had a developer write for me has come uh, very much in handy where basically it'll find all instances of the class table whenever it exists inside of class equals, you know, and then a set of classes with the table. Um, well, actually, these slides, like I said, they'll be available online after if you want to go grab this code snippet, but I find myself using this all the time when we're waking up CSS. Uh, and finally, I still make this mistake sometimes. <coughs> Don't forget the JavaScript. I go and like nuke all the CSS code, and I'm proud of myself when my Git check-in, you know, is like, you know, 10,000 lines deleted, and like three lines added. Right? I'm like, yes, I'm winning. But then we go in and look at all the JavaScript that triggers um, JavaScript that trigger classes that don't show up in your HTML. Right. So just keep that in mind as you're refactoring your CSS. So. We like all these processes, we like these ideas, uh, but we're big fans of not invented here, right? Why, why rebuild the wheel when it's already out there? So we spent some time to figure out what was already out in the community, um, see if there was a way to figure out how we could do this without having to do it manually every time. Right, so we, we're in the unique situation in consulting where we're not just building this one time and great, we get to have it live in our organization. We're having to spin these up every month, every couple of months with new clients. So we needed a scalable way that it made it really easy to do that. Absolutely. So one of the first things that we came across was CSS documentation. I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but there's a product out there called KSS, and it has a special style of um, comments that you can add to your CSS. And then the nice thing is it'll spit out a bunch of documentation for you. So you can really document exactly what your application is doing. It's great because it's tied to your code, it gives you visibility into what's actually in the product. The unfortunate part of this is that it's really around the code. You're documenting your code. You're not really designing a design system in any way. So static site generators are kind of the next generation of this. You may have seen one of these uh, pattern lab, right? I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with atomic designs and those principles, but Brad Frost has a static site generator that does exactly this. It's based around your patterns and it will generate these patterns. So that's a step up. The problem with this solution though is that it's actually disconnected from your code. So whoever your designer is has to create these modules and then they have to go document them. And the developers go look at it and um, draw from that. There's no guarantees that what's in the pattern library is what's in your application or that the designer didn't forget that step and just sent the Photoshop file on over to the developer. So that leads us to an application platform, right? Or a platform to build this on. There's a couple of these out here. Um, they work by pulling the patterns out of a living application, right? So you can kind of configure your application. We can configure this platform to suck this pattern information out of the product. And so you're starting to get the best of both worlds. You see what's in the application, um, and it's supposedly more pattern-centric, but um, it's pretty complex. It's not an easy task to do. It would take somebody who's really focused on this just to get it up and running. And, and it documents that one app. If you have a different app, you've got to go through that process all over again. So I started, I, I wasn't satisfied with that. I thought there had to be some other better way to figure this out. And so we sat down and envisioned, Marcel and I were on the same on the same project at the beginning of this year. We spent some time envisioning really what we wanted out of this, what would be the most helpful. So we created an open source project uh, called Pattern Pack. And we've implemented this actually at several different organizations now. And today is our actual public launch. We're promoting this today as the first time we're promoting others to come and contribute to the project. It's been great. Slalom's actually now backing this as the first open source project. They're actually putting financial resources and support behind it. Really excited about that. So we definitely want you guys to come check out the Counter Pack project. But what it allows you to do, um, <laughs> um, but what it really allows you to do is to design and build your interface the way you would today, document those patterns in a pattern library, and then share that code with your applications. So once you've gone through the design process, 
You can document the patterns in HTML, CSS, and Markdown, the same technologies that most of your applications are using today. And that's an important piece of this because it means that you're closer to reality. If it works in the pattern market, it's gonna work in your application. So Pattern Pack will then take this information that you've documented and generate a pattern library for you. Read through the documentation, output a website that documents all the patterns that are in this. In addition to that, it creates an NPM or a Bower module that your applications can then take a dependency on. Right? So it can be shared with multiple applications all using the same design system, the same consistent brand look and feel. So it's really kind of as simple as adding a bootstrap or a jQuery to your application. But instead of it being a design system that somebody else designed, this is your pattern line. You're not adding pattern pack to your application. You're adding your design system that you created and documented as in a pattern pattern, right? So it makes it available to multiple applications because what we've done is effectively moved the code for this design system out of the application. We've taken the CSS, taken it out of the app, and put it into the pattern library, which gives it one place to live. It makes it available then to share with more than one application. And what's great is you can actually extend it past just uh, CSS, you can do all the brand assets. So if you have approved images, icons, fonts, whatever it is, you can serve up all those UI assets and just make it super easy for you. Yeah, using all the same technologies that most modern web applications are today, uh, it's pretty straightforward and you can go check it out at patternpack.org. Right, so up until now we've been talking to you a lot about the processes and the concepts behind this. So from here we're going to dive quite a bit deeper into how you can actually use this project, Pattern Pack, to get started with the process. If you're purely a designer who never touches code and wants nothing to do with that, we will not be insulted if you get it. <laughs> this will be a little bit more technical, but it could be good if you want to take some information back to you. Yeah, well, at least let you understand what the developers are dealing with. But hopefully we've uh, smoothed out some of those wrinkles. We've actually started that by creating an example pattern library, right? So this should ease the transition. If you just want to get out there and play with it, you can go and pull down the example library and it should just come up and running and you can toy around with it and see, it, how, see how it works, right? And if you look at this, it's pretty austere, but that's intentional, right? We don't want people to view this as another version of Bootstrap or a new foundation system. This is a framework for you to build your own version of Bootstrap with your visual brand and your custom look and feel. So just like any other project, you start out by creating a new project and doing an NPM install of our pattern pack product. Right? This will create a pattern library project for you. So just, just to make that clear, the idea is that you're not embedding this into your existing application. You're creating a new project, a new repository that's going to house all this stuff. So it's a grunt file uh, or a grunt plugin for any of the developers in the house. It should be very straightforward. There's a few configuration options. They're very minimal. You can override everything to customize it to your needs. But uh, again, this is kind of going over your head a little bit. You can start with the example project. If this makes sense, then there's documentation on exactly how to uh, customize all of this. You run the run pattern pack command, and then it will immediately start a new web server on your local machine, pop up a web browser, and show you the pattern library as it exists at that time. Right? So there shouldn't be much in there at this point in time. But the next step is for you to add your own patterns to the pattern library. Each pattern is composed of really two different files, a uh, CSS file and a markdown file. So the CSS file will document the, the will be the CSS that actually ends up getting shared with everything for the button itself, right? So just a few styles there. And then like Marcelo talked about, we've boiled this down to a simple markdown file that has the key pieces that any pattern library that you've seen in the industry has, right? It's got a title, it's got a description that tells you how the thing should be used so developers aren't kind of abusing it or not knowing when and how they should use it. It also has an example, right? This is a visual example It's gonna show the button on the pattern library for you so you can get a feel for how it looks, how it interacts, and this is done in HTML, the same code that you're gonna be using in your application. And finally, you're gonna give the developers a little love here and give them an example Right, this is 
actually going to output some documentation that they can use to then copy and paste in. So you'll see that that code there will generate something like this in your pattern library. So there's the name, the description, you'll see the visual example, and then at the bottom, a developer comes along and says, well, I want this larger button to come down here and line it up and just grab the line of code and then just drop into their app. What's great is even for me. Um, so I am the designer who codes. So once we once we have an application with a visual aesthetic that's laid down, um, you know, it's a pretty mature design system. I can come straight in here and design a new component. So let's say we're building a wizard for the first time. I can build that wizard component with the different steps straight in HTML and CSS because we've actually built in all some great development tools like Live Reload, automatic SAS compilation, or less. Um, and, and so I can just come in here, design a component, and it's ready to go for the developers. Yeah, it's a pretty smooth workflow. You can come over here, add a new pattern, uh, have your browser up on another monitor, and you would see that pattern refresh on the screen with your code automatically. So it's a really smooth workflow to get those things refined. The next thing you'll have to do, and this is where it gets really techy, so hang in there with me, is release these uh, patterns, right? Because we're supporting multiple applications with a single design system, what we don't want to do is have a great new button style, put that out there, and then break the three other applications that don't want that, right? So semantic versioning is a versioning pattern that a lot of applications use. You don't have to use this, though. Um, but it does kind of make sense. So let me run you through that really quickly. If you have a bug fix, you just increment the last number, right? So this means that the code won't break. You're just fixing things. If you have something new to add, you increment the middle number. So any application out there that wants to pull that down is probably pretty safe because they probably haven't implemented this new pattern that you've got anymore. The last one is for breaking changes. That's where we've changed what we think a cable means or what a button means. And so if you bring that on, you're probably going to have to go back and rework your application. Again, the most important thing is to customize this versioning process to your needs. And in our experience, the best way to do that is to align it with the versioning uh, paradigm that your application uses, right? So if you have an application you're working on version 3, but out in the wild, you're not done with your version 3 yet, you're still adding features. There's at least two out there and a bug fix that comes in. You would want to be able to come down here and add a bug fix with a new version. You can add that into the pattern library, tag that version number. You can even update your application then to pull that in and uh, not affect other applications that don't take in the new version or even your application that's on version 3. And what's great is Pattern Pack as a box supports the ability to version your design system like this. Yeah. So the process is pretty simple. You run the build process to generate your pattern library. You're doing this on a regular basis as you're working through adding new patterns anyway. When you're happy with that, you run the release command and it will increment the version number for you. You really don't have to worry about this, right? You can just tell it what that you want a new release. It'll do that for you. And then for all you uh, hackers out there, you push that code out there to, uh, yeah, you push the code out there to the repository and make it available to everyone else. So, uh, for any astute developers out there, that's the typo on that slide. <laughs> <laughs> it should be git push, save, tag, or follow tags. Because yeah. you're pushing the tags. So basically, it tags your commit so that an application can go and point to that specific version. So we've got our, our pattern library process in place, right? We can make these patterns, we can release new versions, we can support multiple applications and even multiple releases of an application. But how do we even get it into my application, right? Is this, this is kind of different from how we normally do things. So again, at that point, you're NPM installing your pattern library, not pattern pack, but your new pattern library. It will generate an NPM package for you. Now, most people are used to this. You say npm install pattern, pattern pack, or npm install run, whatever the thing is. Those are published out on a public repository. And that might be great if you're Uber or someone who wants to develop in the open. But I know that most of the people uh, I work with keep all their code pretty private and aren't publishing their things out on public registries, right? So there is a way around that. You would just create your awesome pattern library and then what you end up doing is pointing to your local Git repository or something, a private repository on it, on GitHub. You may need to put a username and password on there. You'll definitely need to point it to your repository, and then you tell it what version that it needs to pull down. It's a little different than what you may be used to, but it keeps all your code private and allows you to do this in an enterprise setting. Right? Again, 
your application will then run an npm install command. What will happen is your pattern library will come down as a node module and it has the CSS built in right there. So all you need to do is add that link to the CSS file and those styles will then be available to you in your application just the way they normally are. Um, so, so Pattern Pack supports all these things out of the box. Um, and when we bring it back around and kind of how does it integrate to our design process, it's really at the center of our design process that we talked about, right? So many of our projects, we move to the workflow where we sketch and then we go build the Pattern Pack, right? It causes the role of the designer to change like we talked about. But um, we get out of the business of designing comps, right? That's the whole concept behind the UX. That's something we didn't talk about earlier. If anybody's read the book Meet UX, building a pattern library is like step three of 15, right? And they say that because it allows you to prototype ideas and put them in front of potential customers much faster than Photoshop comps or actual wireframes or anything like that. Um, when we get out of that business, it lets us fight those zombie interfaces like we talked about. You can see how by modularizing our interfaces, right, and breaking them apart into those reusable components, documenting them so that developers can access them, um, easily see them, and then sharing that code and keeping it alive. You're gonna, you're not gonna get a zombie pattern library, your pattern library is gonna stay alive. So that's the end of our talk. Thank you all for coming out. Um, oh yeah,
is something that we've seen but we haven't had a chance to explore is NPM a month or two ago actually launched the ability to do private NPM packages. Um, we have not had a chance to explore that yet, but that could potentially be another solution to that problem. So yes. does Node have to be running on your um, production servers for this to work? So not on your production servers because the actual result of this is that the CSS ends up in your application, right? It's pulled in as a static dependency, so it doesn't have to run all the time. It just has to run a build process, right? So you do need to have uh, Node and Grunt available to run when you do your build process. Does that make sense? Um, that may mean that on, on your servers, if you have like a CI system or continuous delivery. Does that make sense? Uh, not quite. Okay. So Did I answer the wrong question? Well, no, it's just that I'm not that technical. Okay. Okay. So, okay. like, if I were to set up my own development environment on my laptop, yep. um, I would expect to install Node on that. Yep. Or if I was going to install it within, um, when the like, developers would use the job when it's being brought into the actual app, they have to have Node installed. Um, well. Because this does use a packaging system like Bower or like NPM, in order to use those, NPM is referred to as the Node Package Manager, uh, but uh, those require Node to even run. So the module and packaging system that we're using is a Node-based system. Any other questions? Yes. Does building your stuff inside of the pack force you to get rid of the cascade of CSS so to kind of not see this thing works here and then you put it in your application you have like normalized that CSS in your app and close it. So we haven't done anything to change how CSS works, right? Um, in the near future maybe as web components become available, this may need to be massaged a little bit because then we will be able to have CSS that is isolated using Shadow DOM. Uh, today, that's not really available to anybody. So uh, that's why Marcella did talk about the BAM syntax and probably namespacing your components. Because you can totally write a style in your uh, button pattern that goes and changes how all the tables work. Right? So it doesn't enforce that. We try to make that best practice. Does that make sense? Yeah. We really get the, like when we do this, what's great about it is we can set up like code reviews and pull requests and all that that are entirely focused on your pattern library. Right? I think for a lot of developers, whenever if you do, if, if in your organization you do code reviews or pull requests to get stuff in there, CSS is always like the, oh, we took a quick glance at that, but nobody really leaves comments, right? You can put in processes in your organization to get people writing better CSS, and so you can hopefully catch those problems. The tools can't fix bad developer practices. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good note. We do have kind of a development roadmap. One of the things that we're looking at probably end of this year, beginning of next year, is introducing some visual regression testing tied to the pattern library itself. So I make a CSS change, I rebuild my pattern library, and I get some kind of test that tells me what patterns were actually modified by the code that was changed. So if I'm going to change my button and it broke three of my accordions, that's not what I intended to do, right? So um, this sets us up for some more advanced capabilities. We're not quite there yet, but again, Maybe there's the open source project. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So, did you recommend um, kind of like digging into the current CSS and using the same uh, like declaration names or whatever, or do you recommend just kind of starting from scratch and then having people with those code in and as they make you? Uh, it all it all really depends on your situation, right? And that's what we tell a lot of clients. Um, we were just talking to a client on, uh, on Friday that had that literally they have 40 applications in their organization with designs going back to like the early 2000s. And so what we said is you probably don't want to try to retrofit 40 applications at once. We said let's pick one meaningful application, build your design system around that, and then over time you can start migrating new applications. Because they said they wanted to eventually rebuild most of them, right? So we can slowly move each application to that new design system as we rebuild them. Right, so it, it really it depends. Is the, yeah. the right answer? If, if you have a an existing application and you can isolate a specific thing that you want to change, the header of the application, and you know what those styles are, you can remove those styles and replace them with a new pattern. It's a little bit more.
risky because you're actually removing stuff that you may or may not fully understand the impact, right? The less risky way to do it would be to just make an all new component and then migrate that in yeah. as, as you have time and energy to go and progress your site. Pattern library documents all your 